so very good evening to friends in asia and good afternoon good morning to other friends from different places wherever you are i'm really happy today and privileged and uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce professor sikhen pai from national taiwan university is a very very well known name in the field of spintronics uh, and i'm really de delighted to have him on board in this uh, webinar series on spintronics we call it w2s and i'm really happy today is the 81st seminar uh, which will be given by sifeng um, and uh, i'm really grateful to all the speakers like him who have been very very generous and kind to accept our invitations so on behalf of my w2s team i really sincerely uh, appreciate and express my heart heartfelt thanks Uh, for kindly joining our seminar program so a little bit about his career so professor pai received his phd in applied and engineering physics from cornell university in 2014 his phd studies focused on the gian spin hall effect in transition metals and the spin orbit torques in magnetic heterostructures after graduating from cornell he worked at massachusetts institute of technology or mit as a postdoctoral research associate in the department of material science and engineering uh, he is currently a faculty member in the department of material science and engineering at the national taiwan university he has a lot of experience other than his postdocs phd and current affiliations he uh, worked as a consulting research fellow at the mram team of itri uh, from 2016 to 2022 and since 2019 He is presently working as the vice chair of the prestigious IEEE Magnetic Society of the Taiwan chapter. He has got many awards, and I will just speak a few. For instance, in 2016, he got the ASEAN Union of Magnetic Societies Young Researcher Award. In 2018, he got the Industrial Technology Research Institute Outstanding Research Award. 2019, he got the Ministry of Science and Technology Young Scholar Fellowship. 2020 he got two awards one is taiwan semiconductor industry association award for young researcher and another is minister of science and technology tao yu yu memorial award so uh, i am really delighted uh, professor pai to have you here and i just like to make a small announcement that during the lecture we don't take questions so if you have any questions you may kindly write that in the chat box uh, at the end of the lecture i would uh, request uh, Sifeng to stop sharing the screen and would request all the participants to turn on the camera so that we can take a group photo and after that we will take the question answer session so with this uh, i now request you to begin your lecture thank you so much okay so uh first of first and foremost i would like to thank professor uh, vitanta for uh you know inviting me to uh, give this lecture uh, for this uh, very very uh, you know uh well, you know uh like i would say a very informative uh, webinar series on spintronics since i i just know that uh, uh i am the i'll be the, uh, the the 81st so you can see that uh there are a lot of well known researchers i uh, just look at the list uh you know from this community so i'm honored to be uh become one of them and then give this lecture um so the topic uh, that i'm going to talk about today is sort of like the you know um related to what uh, people have been doing for the past decades you know trying to improve and to enhance you know the overall for instance spin hall angle or the spin orbital efficiency of uh, different kinds of uh, mechanisms uh, but over here i'm going to show you just one of them uh, it is by using uh, the orbital currents or the orbital hall effect from uh, light you know 3d transition metals um so uh For this work, uh, it's done in collaboration with uh, Taiwan Semiconductor uh, Manufacturing Company. So uh, we're lucky that uh, they supported us uh, for this project. Um, so here is the outline of my talk. So for the first part, uh, I'm going to give a very very brief introduction of what's the difference uh, between spin currents and orbital currents, and Uh, how people started from you know uh, spin hall effect or those uh, spin orbit coupling dominated effect 
to uh, look into spin orbit coupling light or spin orbit coupling free, you know, spin orbital generation mechanisms. Uh, that will be referring to you know, the orbital Hall effect or the orbital Rajbach Aldenstein effect. And then I'll switch gear to talk about the experiments that we've done uh, for the past two years. Uh, first of all, I'll talk, I'm talk about uh, introducing chromium and vanadium. Uh, they are uh, these uh, transition metals or, or 3D transition metals over here on the periodic table. We dope this kind of uh, you know, 3D transition metals into platinum-based magnetic heterostructures. And as you might already know, uh, platinum uh, is a very popular spin hole material because it has a very strong spin orbit interaction. It's a 5D transition metal. Um, so why incorporating chromium and vanadium into platinum can significantly enhance the overall spin orbital efficiency. That's the, uh, you know, the main focus of this uh, presentation. Uh, and if time allows, uh, I'm going to introduce a little bit about our more recent studies on introducing copper uh, and also copper related uh, you know, uh, compounds uh, into platinum based magnetic heterostructures. And that will also show uh, a similar you know, enhancement of, of the overall spin orbit interaction and or sorry, the overall spin orbit uh, you know, uh, torque generation efficiency uh, that allows us to switch the magnetization more efficiently. Uh, using the overall spin of the torque. And then I will talk about the conclusion and the outlook. So uh, I, I believe that most of the students here, they are uh, probably uh, you're familiar with uh, this uh, you know, spin hall effect or the you know, Rajbah effect, but uh, I still need to go through this uh, uh, introduction a little bit. Uh, so there are several ways to generate spin currents. But conventionally, they are all generated by spin orbit coupling uh, in solids. Uh, for instance, uh, in this work uh, by uh, Nakayama and co workers uh, back in 2016, uh, they showed that uh, if you use a bismuth silver interface uh, that can send current through this interface, uh, that will generate a strong Rajbah effect. And that, uh, or typically we can call this spin Rajbah out of sight effect, or SRE. Uh, and the reason why we spin here is because it's related to the spin orbit coupling and it will cause the spin accumulation. And this kind of uh, interfacial uh, Rajbah effect or Rajbah, uh, you know, uh, Aldenstein effect will generate a transverse spin current that is orthogonal to the charge current. And that spin current can be utilized to, for instance, like dry magnetization switching or uh, create some effective fields. And on the other hand, uh, if you are familiar with the spin hole effect, you know that that is the bulk origin. Uh, that is the bulk origin of the spin current. So for instance, as shown in this, uh, there are actually a lot of papers, but what I chose here is just a representative one. Uh, this uh, interesting work by uh, Satru Emory and co-workers back in MIT uh, in 2013, they showed that if you use platinum cobalt iron bilayer structure, and if you send current through this kind of bilayer structure, you can generate uh, this kind of transverse spin current and will inject spin uh, into the ferromagnetic layer. And that will cause you know, uh, the generation of a spin over torque, or uh, at that time, they call this uh, a slow sushi glide uh, effective field or damping light effective field. And that will cause you know, magnetization switching. And as you can see, like if you change the buffer layer material to tantalum, um, in contrast to platinum, uh, the switching loop uh, induced by the current uh, will be opposites. So they will have opposite polarities. So this is an evidence uh, showing that platinum and tantalum, they have opposite signs of spin hole angle, or you can say they have opposite signs of spin hole conductivities. And if you're in, the, in this field, I believe that uh, these kind of knowledge uh, uh, is, uh, is very common to you. And more importantly, if you utilize this kind of uh, either effective field or damping light torque, uh, you can drive not only just uh, current induced magnetization switching. Uh, as shown in this work, uh, what I, you know, I didn't show the data over here is that you can drive uh, also, for instance, the minimal motion uh, that is uh, with some involvement of uh, Jalosinski moria interaction or some other type of anti-symmetric you know, exchange interaction. However, uh, if you look into uh, some older literatures, uh, for instance, back in 2008, uh, people have already started talking about uh, different kinds of 
Hall effect, uh, which is called the orbital Hall effect uh, when they discuss spin Hall uh, effect. Uh, but at that time, uh, it was not really looked into very in, in detail, uh, and not on, uh, until very recently, uh, people started to look look into this orbital current generation or orbital effect uh, more carefully. So we see a lot of uh, new publication uh, getting out uh, during the past two or three years. Uh, for orbital currents or orbital Hall effects, you know, spin orbit coupling uh, is typically not required. So it is not limited to uh, those materials with strong spin orbit coupling, such as platinum or tantalum. So in order to observe orbital Hall effect or orbital Rothbard Edelstein effect or generate you know, orbital currents, uh, in fact, we don't really need a material system with strong spin orbit coupling, such as platinum or tantalum, like I just mentioned earlier. Uh, but in terms of theory, uh, since I'm not a theorist, so I'm just going to go through this very quickly. So if you're interested in the uh, detail of the theories or how to generate, you know, uh, this kind of orbital currents. Uh, I, I strongly, uh, you know, uh, recommend these uh, two papers. For instance, if you are interested in the orbital Rashbaugh Ellison effect, which is a, uh, you know, uh, an, uh, you know, analogy to the uh, the spin, you know, Rashbaugh Ellison effect, uh, it is caused by the chiral orbital te uh, texture uh, in the materials. So similar to the Rashbaugh, the classical spin Rashbaugh effect, if you uh, shift the Fermi surface due to the electric current, then they will have a, a net, you know, uh, angular moment, uh, orbital angular momentum accumulation uh, along the transverse direction. So that will give rise to a transverse, you know, orbital current. Uh, similarly, if you look into orbital Hall effect, uh, which is uh, caused by the electric field driven hybridization of the orbital states, uh, for instance, in this paper by Go and co-workers uh, in PRL, they show that uh, through the hybridization of the tangential component and the radial component of the orbital um, in the materials, uh, you can cause this kind of uh, similar you know, imbalance of the uh, orbital angular momentum accumulation uh, when you apply a current longitudinally. So again, uh, when you apply a current longitudinally, for instance, uh, along the KX direction, you'll get this kind of, uh, I'm sorry, in this case, yeah, in along KX direction, you'll get this uh, accumulation of uh, you know, orbital angular momentum uh, along Y direction, uh, which means that uh, in a pictorial way, uh, if you apply a longitudinal charge current, uh, you, you will get a, a transverse you know, orbital uh, current uh, that is related to the orbital, uh, orbital angular momentum, uh, you know, deflection. And in terms of experiments, uh, back in 2020, uh, this very uh, interesting seminal work uh, done by, uh, I believe, uh, Matthias Clowey's group, uh, they show that uh, in this kind of heterostructure, for instance, originally, if you just have platinum and thulean iron garnet, uh, so platinum is the you know conventional spin hole material that I just mentioned earlier, and thulean iron garnet over here is a, a ferry magnetic material. Uh, it's a ferry magnetic insul magnetic insulator with perpendicular anisotropy. So uh, if you have strong enough you know uh, spin current or sorry sorry uh, charge current flowing in this platinum thulean iron garnet by layer structure, uh, the Conventional like box spin hole effect will give rise to uh, you know a transverse spin current being injected into the field on garnet, and that can cause uh, some spin orbit effective field. That can be detected by uh, this uh, hysteresis loop shift measurement. So in this kind of measurement, uh, the the strength of the effective field is interpreted as uh, you know correlated to the uh, uh, the strength of the damping like tor efficiency, or you can say the spin hole angle of the material system. And in this case, it is the platinum layer. Uh, however, they found that if you uh, if they cap this uh, platinum layer with a copper oxide layer, uh, which is a light transition metal oxide, uh, there's a significant enhancement in terms of this uh, spin hole angle, or you can say the damping light torque uh, efficiency, uh, which is more than ten folds. Okay, so uh, here is the I mean the black data over here is representative. Uh, representing the, uh, the the results from the samples without the copper oxide. Okay, so it's just platinum, thulean, iron, garnet. 
And you can see that by changing the platinum thickness, uh, the enhancement of this uh, efficiency corresponds to a very nice spin diffusion model. So this can be well explained by the conventional spin hole scenario. However, if you have this copper oxide you know, capping layer, suddenly there's a, a very huge enhancement of this uh, overall you know, damping high core efficiency as evidenced by this here hysteresis uh, shift measurement. And only when the platinum layer thickness is within this range, for instance, uh, between one to three nanometers, uh, you can see this kind of enhancement. Uh, when the platinum thickness uh, starts to increase to more than four nanometers, then you start to see this behavior converging to this classical or conventional spin hole scenario, which suggests that you know, something different uh, is, uh, has happened uh, when you have a thin platinum layer, and especially when you have a copper oxide capping layer. And later on, we'll see that this is interpreted as you know, the orbital Rajbar Ellison effect, which will generate you know, spin, additional you know, spin accumulation uh, from the orbital. Uh, you know, uh, orbital current, and that will diffuse through the platinum layer and be injected into uh, the thulium iron garnet layer. And if you look at the orbital hole effect, uh, the, the, the scenario of generating uh, this uh, uh, torque effect is very similar. Uh, for instance, in this paper by Go and co-workers uh, on physical review research two years ago, uh, they show you that if you have an orbital hole effect, uh, happen in this normal metal layer. Uh, and if you have this orbital current uh, being ge uh, generated and it is transversed through the charge current, and it can be injected. Now this orbital angular momentum can be injected into the ferromagnetic layer. However, uh, in terms of experiment, and especially in this paper, uh, it emphasizes on the steps of creating such you know, orbital torque, or how we can get this kind of torque effect. First of all, uh, of course, you have to generate this orbital current. Uh, either from the orbital hole effect or from the orbital Rajma other side effect. However, we know that the orbital angular momentum or represented by L uh, cannot be directly enforced onto the magnetization in the ferromagnetic layer because uh, there's no, uh, if there's no uh, exchange coupling between the orbital angular momentum and the uh, localized magnetic uh, moment, which is typically coming from the spin part, then you know, there is no uh, spin transfer torque. So uh, you always need some uh, spin orbit coupling uh, to convert the orbital angular momentum to spin angular momentum. And that spin angular momentum can be enforced onto uh, the magnetization in the ferromagnetic layer through the conventional you know, the spin transfer torque mechanism. Uh, so over here, the import, uh, one critical uh, thing is that you always need an extra spin orbit coupling to help you convert the orbital, you know, the orbital angular momentum to spin angular momentum. So although we're going to emphasize, uh, people typically emphasize on that the orbital hole effect is not relied on, you know, the strong spin orbit coupling materials. But in, in the end, when you want to convert orbital current, uh, either from a different mechanism, uh, uh, you always need uh, an exchange coupling, uh, you know, between, you know, the localized moment and the spin. Therefore, you need a spin orbit coupling from the ferromagnetic layer. Uh, or from some other layers to give you this kind of uh, uh, you know, exchange interaction. And of course, if we believe that this uh, scenario is true and you know, as evidenced by you know, the, the experiments I just uh, uh, discussed, uh, then we look into the past literatures uh, that what kind of materials will give you large you know, orbital hole effect or orbital currents. And like I just mentioned earlier, Back in 2008, you know, at the beginning of the, the study of a spin hole conductivity, in this very first paper uh, done by Tanaka and co-workers, uh, they already showed that, they already calculated uh, by first principle calculation that uh, the orbital hole conductivity can be large. And if you look into this paper, you'll see that the magnitude of the orbital hole, conduct, orbital hole conductivity is larger than the spin hole conductivity of these 4D and 5D transition metals which means that if you can really detect this kind of orbital uh, currents or orbital hole effect from 5D, 4D transition metals, uh, in terms of magnitude, it is possible that they are larger than the spin hole effect from those uh, conventional like tantalum, tungsten, or platinum, you know, these uh, large spin orbit coupling materials. 
And more interestingly, like if you look into some uh, more recent literatures, uh, also similar calculation has been done uh, on this kind of 3D transition metals, uh, vanadium, chromium, and manganese, uh, they all have this kind of sizable uh, of the whole conductivities, which suggests that um, if you uh, can measure some extra torques uh, or spin orbit torques coming from these kind of uh, materials, it is highly possible that uh, it is coming from uh, the orbital contribution rather than the spin contribution. As you can see over here that the spin hole conductivities from these three uh, transition metals, life during transition metals are pretty small. So last year, uh, this very interesting uh, experimental study showed that uh, by using tantalum as the, 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 you know, the, the spin hall layer or the normal metal to generate the spin orbit torque, if you use different kinds of ferromagnetic materials uh, in adjacent to uh, tantalum, uh, they measure this spin orbit torque effect by uh, using maybe the spin torque fMR measurements. Uh, they show that uh, the sign of the spin hole angle or the overall spin uh, hole conductivity seems to change sign, which is very weird because if you believe that uh, all the, the phenomena or all the torques that you measure are coming from the spin hole effect, then uh, they should all have the negative sign. But over here for the case of nickel tantalum, uh, they found that the, 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 uh, the measured effect uh, is having a positive sign. Uh, and the magnitude, uh, although it's small, but it's not negligible, which means that there is something uh, in addition to the conventional spin hole conductivity coming from the tantalum layer. And they attributed that to uh, the orbital hole uh, conductivity from uh, the tantalum layer. And recall from the previous, uh, you know, you know this uh, uh, data, you'll see that for all these transition metals, uh, either 4D, 5D, or 3D transition metals, most of um, all of the, uh, uh, the orbital hole conductivities are positive, which is uh, opposite to the spin hole conductivity of the tantalum. So it means that if this number is positive, uh, it is possible that when this factor, this conversion factor uh, in the ferromagnetic layer is large enough, and of course, like if this number is also large enough and it can surpass this value, then over, you know, the overall uh, like spin orbital hole conductivity uh, will be a positive number as they show uh, in this experimental study. Okay, so uh, two things are important. Uh, this orbital hole conductivity uh, coming from this normal metal layer and also this conversion coefficient, which allows you to convert the orbital current into spin current, or you can say uh, convert orbital angular momentum to spin angular momentum. So uh, almost about the same time, this also, uh, very interesting study uh, also confirmed, confirms this kind of scenario. Uh, in this case, uh, they have this kind of platinum cobalt bond by layer structure and cobalt bond has a perpendicular in isotropy in, in their case. They show that uh, if you use chromium as the buffer layer instead of just platinum, um, they actually can get this kind of enhancement of the overall spin hole angle or the overall spin orbital efficiency. And this is very odd because chromium itself should have uh, a negative spin hole conductivity or a negative spin hole angle. So when you combine that with platinum and when you increase the chromium thickness as more current is flowing into chromium, you should expect a decrease in terms of uh, the spin hole angle or the overall SOT efficiency because the sign uh, of the spin hole angles for spin hole conductivities for platinum and chrom chromium are opposite to each other. However, over here we see a a significant enhancement, which suggests that, uh, uh, at least according to their scenario proposed here, a chromium has a very large orbital uh, current generation efficiency or orbital hole conductivity, and it is much greater than uh, the spin hole conductivity in the chromium. Uh, so, and in their case, the platinum layer over here, only one nanometer, actually serves as, uh, you know, it, it serves as this uh, conversion layer. So the orbital current will be injected into platinum and it will be converted into spin current and then they inject it or diffuse into uh, the cobalt boron layer. So over here, uh, the, the interconversion from L to S is not achieved in the cobalt boron layer. Instead, it is achieved in the platinum layer. So this is a very interesting study and uh, very consistent with their uh, you know, experimental results. 
because over here, if you see that it just the chromium uh, is, is present, you know, you'll see that uh, the, the spin hole angle is negative. Uh, so only when you have this plot and insertion layer that help you to convert, you know, optical current into spin current, uh, you can see this kind of enhancement. So this is a very interesting study. And together uh, with the scenario uh, uh, that I just uh, mentioned over here, this can also be used to explain the, the results over here. You know, the platinum layer is important because it will be, uh, you know, be used to convert, you know, this efficiency uh, from the uh, orbital uh, whole, you know, orbital current uh, to spin current. So for us, uh, uh, after, you know, going through these literatures, uh, actually before going through these, these kind of literatures, uh, we've already started look, uh, looking into different kinds of, you know, combination of alloys, uh, trying to see if there's any possibility that we can uh, enhance the efficiency to a certain amount. You know, for instance, uh, we know that for platinum, uh, especially for platinum cobalt bilayer system, you know, typically people report, you know, spin hole angles or, uh, or dampen light SOT efficiency ranges from say 10% to 20%. So let's say, you know, uh, the maximum that you can get is about 20 or 30. Uh, if it's still, you know, much smaller than the typical, uh, you know, spin polarization value that you can get from uh, you know, from a fair making layer, for instance, cobalt and boron. If you send a current through, a polarized current through the cobalt and boron layer, you will get a spin polarization about like 50 to 60%, uh, depending on the literatures that you look into. Um, but, you know, in order to make the SOT MRAM, you know, you know, competitive well, compared to SDT MRAM, we need this, uh, you know, conversion efficiency to be as high as possible. So when we collaborated with TSMC, uh, uh, we started to look into this kind of different kinds of combinations of alloys. And of course, we started to look uh, from like Thompson, but um, you know, most of the results are not that positive. So then we turn our focus back to platinum, since this is also a very widely studied material system. So what I'm going to show you today uh, are mainly uh, will be mainly focusing on uh, platinum chromium based uh, you know, heterostructures. So uh, we try to dope chromium into uh, platinum. Sorry about the you know, representation here. It's actually platinum X and chromium Y minus X. But you know, uh, if we want to talk about the chromium concentration, probably it's better to uh, place this in a reverse way. But unfortunately, that is my what my students started with. So I'm going to stick to that. Um, so uh, we try to dope chromium into platinum and see if we, if we can and maintain the uh, perpendicular and isotropy of the cobalt layer on top of it, such that uh, you know, we can do some uh, suitable measurements uh, to characterize SOT by using the uh, techniques that we're familiar with. Uh, so it turns out that uh, for a um, you know, uh, reasonable amount of chromium doping into platinum, uh, we can still get a very, uh, still get a, uh, uh, you know, acceptable PMA uh, by using this kind of hazard structure. So we pa pattern these uh, you know, thin films into whole bar devices uh, and make sure that uh, after patterning into devices, they, they still have a perpendicular magnetic isotropy. Uh, as shown over here, you know, uh, when we change the chromium concentration or uh, we change the pattern concentration, uh, you know, a lot of uh, the device, uh, most of the devices can still have a you know, very nice out of plane you know, um, you know, hysteresis loop, which is just that they can keep PMA. Um, so if we plot this, um, you know, against the concentration of platinum, uh, and this is uh, MR over MS. Uh, so uh, if it's close to one, means that the, the loop is very square, and you know you have a large remnants uh, when you turn off the magnetic field, so it has uh, decent PMA. Well, we'll see that uh, for the chromium case, uh, it has a wider range uh, that allows us to do more uh, measurements uh, with the PMA samples. Uh, while for the vanadium case, like we dealt vanadium into platinum, uh, you know, we have some, uh, you know, uh, some uh, data points over here, but uh, when, you, when, when the vanadium concentration is, uh, you know, go beyond like 30%, uh, we start to see this decay of, uh, you know, the perpendicular and isotropy. Uh, so that's the reason why I said I'm going to focus on platinum chromium uh, for this case. And for the, you know, um, for hysteresis loop shift measurement, or, you know, uh, in order to characterize the SOT, uh, we use, utilize a, a method that I 
uh, you know, you know, I proposed uh, back in 2015, uh, several years ago, uh, was on a paper on PRB. Uh, so I won't go into details about this uh, characterization methods. Uh, but the bottom line is that uh, if you uh, apply current, you know, send current uh, along x direction, you know, into this whole bar device, and at the same time you scan the outer plane, uh, you know, scan sweep the outer plane field, um, you should be able to see. Uh, an effective field along z direction that caused the shift in terms of the hysteresis loop. Uh, if there's a, any uh, spin or retort or damping line SOT uh, acting upon the magnetization, in this case, the cobalt layer. Uh, however, in order to see um, you know, observable shifts, at the same time, you also need an implant bias field. And this is consistent with the scenario that you know, people uh, say that for you know, to, to get deterministic SOT switching, you need the, this uh, implant field to break the symmetry. Or uh, a different way to state this is that uh, the implant field will, um, you know, to over will overcome the jello Sixty moria interaction and to realign the domain one moment such that you can start to see the uh, the damping line uh, SOT acting on the domain one moments and that will give you this outer plane effective field. Uh, so for details, you can look into like a search this hysteresis loop measurement. I believe that you can uh, find a lot of uh, papers uh, using this kind of technique to characterize OT. Uh, so I'm going to jump into the results over here because um, it's um, it's uh, the, the main focus here uh, of the today's presentation. Uh, so if we apply large enough uh, in-plane field and the, the DMI effective field can be overcome, uh, we'll see that uh, the effective field per current uh, that we apply into the system will saturate at a value about 30 or so per milliamp. Uh, so what I didn't show over here is that the, the, for the case of pure platinum, uh, typically you will see the number uh, reach about only like say 10 or 20 or so per milliamp. So uh, this is a very significant enhancement uh, when you have chromium uh, into the platinum. And uh, of course, in order to uh, do some benchmark or do some further calculations, uh, we need to use uh, the damping light torque efficiency, or some people will say the spin hole angle uh, as a figure of merit. So we uh, calculate this uh, based on the data that we have. Uh, if we have this uh, uh, H effective, uh, you know, out of plane effective field per current about 30 or so per milliamp, then we'll plug in this into this, uh, plug this number back into this equation. And with some like shunting factor of the device, you know, the thickness of the platinum layer and the width of the whole bar, you know, these uh, materials dependent uh, parameters, uh, which has be, to be determined by VSM, for example, the saturation magnetization. So if you have all these numbers gathered, uh, then you can calculate the damping light -like efficiency of this uh, heterostructure. So here's the result. So, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, when you increase the chromium content uh, or the vanadium content, you can increase the, the effective field per current. But what's more important is that the damping light torque efficiency will also experience this kind of same enhancement. Um, for the pure platinum case, what we have is around like 20%. Uh, you can say the spin hole angle or the damping light torque efficiency is about 20%. Uh, and as you increase the chromium content to above uh, around like 30%, this will reach uh, and saturated about uh, at about like 90%, which is actually a quite a number that is quite large. And uh, at that time, when, when I first, you know, when my, my student presented this data to me, I was quite surprised because uh, this is, um, you know, um, uh, what people, or at least for people from the industry, they, they've been uh, dreaming about, you know, dreaming about this kind of uh, enhancement uh, towards uh, almost 100%. Uh, for this kind of conventional or classical you know, material system, just using metallic structures instead of using uh, like topological insulator or some chalcogenide based material system. Um, so uh, we, at that time, uh, we, we actually got this data back in 2019-ish uh, and, and in uh, you know, 2020, we, we started to see some people uh, getting some similar results. Uh, for instance, this APO paper, uh, they show that uh, if you do throw chromium into platinum, you also see this kind of enhancement, uh, but only slightly. Uh, we're not so sure why, but it's probably related to uh, their layer structure. Uh, they need to have a very thin platinum insertion layer between uh, the buffer layer and the ferromagnetic layer in order to get the PMA. 
uh, unlike our case, uh, because it might depend on the spotted uh, you know, conditions. Uh, unlike our case, uh, the platinum chromium is directly uh, in adjacent to the cobalt layer. But we're not so sure why like this will cause a very significant uh, difference in terms of the magnitude, even for the pure platinum case. But what I can say over here is that uh, we did this uh, several times on you know, samples with different batches. Uh, we always see this kind of significant enhancement. And uh, what I show over here is the results from uh, the PMA case, but we also perform measurements uh, by using uh, in-plane magnetized samples. And we can also get this uh, uh, damping electrode efficiency uh, up to 80 or 90%, which is consistent with uh, the data I show you over here, uh, which, is, uh, which are obtained from the PMA samples. Okay. Uh, so uh, if we want to really look into the mechanism behind this huge enhancement of, you know, the damping electrode efficiency, uh, a typical way to, uh, you know, to, to, to reorganize your data is to plot your damping electrode efficiency or the spin hole angle as a function of, you know, uh, the longitudinal resistivity or the buffer layer. Or you can say just the resistivity of your, you know, uh, buffer layer. In this case, the platinum chromium or platinum vanadium. So the red data here uh, is the, uh, the results from the platinum chromium. And as you can see, although uh, these data, you know, you know, they have this uh, positive correlation uh, with respect to the uh, you know, resistivity, uh, it is not uh, linear. Uh, although you can try to fit it uh, with some, some data over here, you can get an average value of, uh, uh, of the slope, uh, but uh, we can see clearly that it deviates uh, from a linear trend. So it means that uh, it suggests that uh, this enhancement or the the uh, the mechanism uh, of the spin hole or the spin orbital hole conductivity in this material uh, does not follow this uh, intrinsic mechanism uh, from purely um, you know purely from the platinum spin hole conductivity because if you look at the equation here uh, the temperature efficiency is typically represented by the you know the product between the uh, uh, spin hole angle and the interfacial uh, spin transmission coefficient. So I'm not going into details about this uh, transmission coefficient here. Uh, it depends on the ferromagnetic layer uh, and the buffer layer interface uh, because uh, over here we just assume that this is unity uh, such that the spin can be uh, you know 100% or perfectly uh, being transferred into the ferromagnetic layer. So you can say that over here, we assume that the temperature efficiency is the spin hole angle. Okay, uh, so if that's the case, then uh, we, we realize that uh, because spin hole angle is uh, the spin hole conductivity over uh, the uh, conductivity, uh, then you know this, this, this turns out to be spin hole conductivity times the uh, you know the uh, longitudinal resistivity. So if uh, the spin hole conductivity is a constant then we know that uh, the damping efficiency should be linear uh, to the resistivity, uh, which is not the case over here, which means that uh, the spin hole conductivity or the overall spin orbital hole conductivity in this system uh, should not be a constant. When you increase chromium uh, or introduce chromium into uh, the platinum layer, uh, it actually modifies its, its overall like, spin hole conductivity. So uh, instead, uh, we plot the, this uh, spin hole conductivity, or we can say the overall spin hole conductivity as a function of uh, conductivity instead. Then we'll see this kind of trend. So for the pure platinum case, uh, you will see, you'll see that the, the spin hole conductivity is about like four times 10 to the fifth uh, ohm meter inverse. And when you introduce chromium, so it will go this way, uh, you know, when you increase chromium contents, uh, the spin hole conductivity actually increases. So that reflects to uh, this deviation over here. Okay, so it deviates from this linear trend, and it will reach a value. Uh, re it will reach a value as high as uh, you know more than six, you know, times ten to the fifth. No, let's have a I think uh, he was here, but I don't know. Uh, I think he left. There is no bag. Uh, sorry, is there any questions? Uh, if no, I will, I will continue. Uh, so this significant uh, enhancement uh, deviation, this deviation from the pure pattern case, 
uh, suggests that there's an extra contribution. Uh, so over here, uh, we believe that it is related to the orbital hole contribution or the orbital hole conductivity times the, this uh, conversion uh, you know, factor, either coming from the platinum or the cobalt or from the platinum cobalt interface. Uh, so we're not going to uh, you know, you know, go into details about this co conversion coefficient here today, but we know that th this value is possibly you know, well, positive. Uh, and this number, we already know that from theoretical uh, study and uh, the experimental study uh, that I just uh, discussed earlier, it should be a positive number. So this fits uh, to our story and it can explain you know, this kind of enhancement pretty well, actually. And moreover, uh, this, this enhancement instead of decrease, which suggests that uh, the, the spin hole con contribution from the chromium uh, is uh, not as strong as its uh, orbital contribution. So again, this is quite similar to uh, that communication physics paper uh, published last year uh, with the chromium buffer layer and the platinum you know, uh, insertion layer. Except that over here, we use uh, this kind of alloying uh, to, 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 to give rise to a similar uh, enhancement from the orbital hole current. So we believe that uh, the overall spin hole conductivity or the spin orbital hole conductivity contains two parts. Uh, it has the spin hole the, from the platinum, but also having this contribution from the orbital hole effect of the chromium. And of course, uh, to verify that this enhancement uh, of the efficiency is true, uh, we also perform uh, the, the, the conventional you know, spin orbital switching measurement. Uh, to verify the, the critical switching current can actually be uh, reduced. And indeed, we see that uh, for both the chromium and the vanadium case, uh, this kind of uh, SOT switching can be achieved. And uh, more importantly, when we increase the chromium content, which is going this way, uh, reducing the platinum concentration, uh, the critical switching current, uh, IC0 over here, can be significantly reduced uh, and at the same time, the thermal stability of the uh, cobalt layer uh, is, uh, can remain you know, almost constant uh, or you know, uh, it's always above uh, 30. So uh, it means that uh, by introducing chromium into uh, the buffer layer or into platinum, uh, we can have this extra uh, orbital hole contribution uh, and reduce the switching current. But at the same time, the thermal stability uh, of the device can uh, remain mostly unchanged. Okay, so based on the switching data, we can also uh, do some benchmark. For instance, we can calculate the switching efficiency. Uh, uh, and if you're not familiar with the switching efficiency, this is different from the SOT uh, efficiency that we just mentioned earlier. This is uh, borrow from the uh, community of, uh, of the SDT uh, MRAM. Uh, they typically use this uh, big, uh, this uh, kind of uh, number as a figure of merit. Uh, it is uh, the thermal stability factor uh, divided by the, the zero thermal critical switching current. Uh, so as you can see, if you have the same thermal stability and if you have a reduced IC0, then the switching efficiency will be higher. So we want this to be you know, as high as possible. And that's what we observe here uh, as well, because we already know that thermal stability uh, you know, is always you know, around 30 or in between 30 to 40. Uh, but at the same time, the switching current dens uh, density or the switching current has been reduced. So we see this kind of enhancement of the switching efficiency, EPSO, uh, when we you know, uh, in introduce chromium into the buffer layer. And at the same time, we also see that if you calculate the power consumption based on resistivity and the switching current density, uh, you will see this kind of significant reduction of the switching power uh, you know, uh, that needs to be used to switch the magnetization in this kind of device. So in order to compare our results to, uh, to, to others, uh, we uh, this, you know, sort of assume that there is this kind of uh, ideal you know, SOTM RAN structure uh, with this uh, spin current source layer uh, that's been patterned in this, into this kind of channel. And on top of it, this, uh, there's a fair magnetic layer or fair mag magnetic pillar uh, on top of this uh, spin current source layer. 
that will be switched by the SOT. So we, we borrow uh, you know, all the, the data from different literatures, uh, which is uh, mainly from those uh, with the platinum-based material systems. Uh, we can see that uh, platinum chromium data will be over here. If we calculate the power consumption per switching uh, by using uh, this kind of ideal uh, device structure. And uh, as you can see over here, most of the platinum alloys uh, they, they have uh, that relatively low um, you know, power consumption while compared to, for instance, tungsten, tantalum, or, or some other conventional materials. So we suggest that you know, if you can further enhance you know, uh, the efficiency uh, using platinum-based materials, you can probably give rise to uh, even lower power consumption. And uh, if you're interested in you know, uh, all these kind of uh, benchmark, there are several uh, good works, uh, not only uh, from our papers, for instance, uh, this uh, very nice review work uh, by uh, Dr. Li Jun Zhu uh, at that time at Cornell University. Uh, he showed that uh, you know, uh, by using this kind of uh, a benchmark, uh, you can uh, confirm that uh, the platinum-based materials will have a very nice you know, uh, uh, you know, reasonably high dampening efficiency, but at the same time, a uh, uh, very, very low power consumption. Okay, and not only in this review paper, uh, also from our industrial collaborator TSMC, they also uh, published, um, you know, two years ago that uh, if you uh, perform this kind of benchmark, uh, typically platinum-based materials will have uh, the lowest, you know, power consumption. Oh, except for this outlier using bismuth antimony, you know, MBE uh, or exfoliate flex, which means that they are actual materials. So I think I'm uh, almost running out of time. So I'm going to speed up a little bit and just talk about uh, the, the copper case or the copper nitrate case in, in, in one slide. Uh, so uh, over here, uh, I, I, I show you this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, heterostructure uh, similarly, you know, using platinum cobalt bilayer structure, but the capping layer uh, is uh, replaced uh, by using this uh, copper nitride cap uh, layer. And uh, as you can see over here, when we uh, the Q represents uh, the uh, the flow rate of nitrogen, you know, into the sparring system with respect to the argon. Uh, so when you increase the nitrogen content into the material system, uh, the effective field per current density will increase dramatically. And also, if you calculate, convert that into dampening light efficiency, we'll see this kind of enhancement uh, from about 10% to uh, more than 40% or close to 50% in this case. So it again suggests that, you know, if you use a copper nitride layer as the capping layer, it will give you this extra orbital current uh, contribution. And the orbital current will be injected into cobalt. And over here, there's an orbital to spin conversion uh, and that will lead to this kind of enhancement of the overall spin orbital hole conductivity. So as you can see that, uh, well, compared to the control sample, uh, this has this significant enhancement. So uh, here's the last slide, uh, the conclusion and long look. If you are interested in the work, uh, it has already been accepted, but not published yet. Uh, so uh, it's already on archive for a while. Uh, you can look into that. So my main conclusion is that the overall spin uh, orbital hole conductivity consists of two parts. Uh, one is related to the orbital hole effect, one is related to the spin hole effect. And more importantly, for the orbital hole part, it relies on this interconversion of, uh, you know, uh, either coming from the ferromagnetic layer or from the, uh, from the heavy metal layer. For instance, in the case over here, it's converted by the platinum layer or over here converted by a cobalt layer. And we believe that uh, with for some further interface in transparency engineering, we can probably you know, have even larger template SOT efficiency, perhaps beyond unity uh, by using uh, the platinum-based heterostructures. Uh, so with that, uh, I will, I'll, I'd like to thank, thank you again for uh, listening and see if you have any questions. Okay, thank you, Sifeng, for this fantastic uh, lecture. Really a very rich amount of results going towards new directions. 
very nice to see that. Uh, before we take the questions, uh, I'd like to request you to stop sharing and I request all of you to mm -hmm. switch the camera so that we can make a screenshot. Oh, I don't guess. Nice. Okay. Please allow me. A lot of people have not switched on their camera. Okay. Smile. Okay. Okay, so we are done. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, please share your screen again. Sure, no problem. Uh, let me see. All right, we see it. Uh, so Professor Sasi Satpati has asked some questions here and you can directly to me, I am uh, reading it. Uh, as you may know, Professor Satpati is also working intensely uh, from University of Missouri, uh, he's a theoretic cell. Uh, so he says, uh, uh, thanks for a very nice talk. Not sure if you are aware of several theory papers in the last couple of years, that have suggested the 2D transition metal dichalcogenides such as MOS2 as good systems to observe the orbital Hall effect. Do you have any comments on the possibility of experimental observation of orbital Hall effect in these 2D systems? Yeah, I, I think that in terms of uh, experiments, that would be very similar to uh, what I showed you over here. Uh, especially when, when, we, uh, when I talk about the, the literatures, um, for instance, in this case, uh, uh, in, 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 in this case, the, the orbital uh, effect is uh, attributed to an interfacial effect. And I believe that for a 2D system, it will be a very nice platform uh, to observe the orbital, you know, uh, Rajva effect. And more importantly, uh, it might have some angle dependence uh, because for 2D materials, like if you prepare this with using, uh, you know, exfoliated, uh, or, you know, uh, attachal growth methods. Uh, it means that the crystal orientation will give rise to, uh, you know, this anisotropy in terms of orbital, uh, anisotropy of the orbital uh, Hall effect or orbital Rajba effect. Uh, so I believe that uh, a better way to, to see this kind of uh, angle dependence will be using uh, SDFMR uh, because spin torfemin and resonant can give, give you this, uh, a very nice, uh, you know, angle dependent torque, you know, ratios. So uh, this this might be a, a direction. Um, so that's my my two cents on like uh, using two D materials or you know TMD systems to to observe the orbital Hall effect. We yeah. already see that like for MOS two or MOT two, for example, it can have this uh, very exotic, uh, you know, uh, spin hole effect, like transverse spin hole effect, like they. They, uh, you know, mentioned like, several years ago. So I believe that that will we, we should be able to see the same thing uh, in the uh, the orbital uh, whole case. Okay. So uh, before I take the questions of a few others, uh, just to add, so you are telling that the uh, angle dependent uh, spin orbital torque measurements will reveal the contribution of the orbital Hall effect uh, from the spin Hall effect. That's what you are telling. Yeah, I believe so because uh, the orbital, uh, for instance, the orbital effect, uh, as stated over here, uh, is related to, let's they say, the hybridization of the orbital states. So it might be related to like how the crystal is being oriented. Of course, you know, the orbital state means that it's in the K space, but I mean, I mean, in a real space, if you have some certain like a crystal symmetry breaking, it might also change the orbital texture. So I believe that uh, if you uh, if you look into 2D materials and if you do uh, this uh, angle dependent, you can probably distinguish it too, because the spin hole and all the um, you know might just come from the spin hole recoupling, and they might have a different angle dependence, uh, you know, with, with, well compared to the the orbital case. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a few more questions. Obviously, please go ahead. Hello, am I, am I audible? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, this is Bibhuti actually. So thank you for for giving a very insightful talk. My question is that uh, when you uh, show the figure like uh, damping like uh, torque versus resistivity of this, where you change the chromium, uh, you know, concentration and it doesn't fit into the linear part, and but uh, where you assume that the spin hole angle is like constant, but when you uh, change it into not constant, it is also not fitting into that, uh, you know, graph. Can you please elaborate why it is not happening? And uh, there you also say that you have also uh, showed the contribution of uh, orbital, which is more than that of SH. Have you quantified it? Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah. I have your problem because uh, it's, uh, the, the internet, I think the, uh, you know, the signal cannot be that good. So uh, I believe that your question is related to uh, this, uh, the data shown over here, right? Yes, yes. Uh, so there's a this uh, deviation from the linear trend, but uh, when you talk about uh, the spin hole angle, like uh, you say that there's an assumption that this is a constant. Yeah, you said that the theta is a, uh, sorry sigma s is, is not constant here, right? Uh, yeah. So over here, um, like like on the left hand side at the beginning, for instance, we wanted uh, we wanted to. Uh, you know, to see if this is a linear trend, because uh, in a previous study that we published uh, maybe two years ago, we used platinum with copper. And in that case, uh, if you plot the, uh, the damping line coefficiency uh, as a function of the longitudinal resistivity, uh, there will be a very perfect linear trend, which suggests that uh, when you throw copper into platinum, um, it just increased the, for instance, the, uh, the scattering, uh, and therefore, you just increase the row xx without changing the uh, the, the sigma uh, spin hole conductivity, uh, and therefore the mechanism of generating uh, the spin current is still coming from the spin hole effect of the platinum. Uh, but over here, we see that it deviates from a linear trend, or you know, uh, there there's no linear trend over here. So uh, instead, uh, we plot this, uh, you know, just directly using the ratio. You know, this is just directly by using the ratio between, for instance, uh, I believe that the damping line torque efficiency and the longitudinal resistivity. So by each point, you know, you just uh, use the, uh, you know, the uh, damping line torque efficiency number and then divide that by the uh, longitudinal resistivity and just plot that data out as a function of uh, sigma RSX. And uh, if this is coming from uh, an intrinsic mechanism, then we should expect that uh, over here, so let me switch to uh, pointer. We should expect that over here from the pure platinum to a certain amount of dopant uh, concentration, it should be a flat line because it means that uh, the spin hole effect is, uh, or the spin hole conductivity is purely coming from, uh, for instance, the intrinsic uh, mechanism uh, of, the, uh, of the spin hole effect of platinum. But over here, we see this enhancement uh, when we move from here to here. So that's the reason why I said uh, we believe that there is an extra contribution. So um, for example, uh, if we use a previous data uh, coming from, uh, you know, obtained from platinum copper, pay, uh, platinum copper case, uh, we'll see that uh, the line, you know, the data points uh, on this chart will be fairly flat uh, because uh, within the amount a certain amount of copper doping into a platinum, uh, there's no change in terms of the overall uh, spin hole conductivity. Okay, thank you. Uh, Andreas, please unmute and ask. One second, I apologize. So thank you for the talk. Um, Actually, in the answer to the first question, you mentioned for the first time kind of the crystal structure, and that's what baffled me a little bit, given that this is a, uh, an orbital effect. The orbitals that are involved in the conduction should matter, and therefore the crystal orientation should matter. But in none of your samples, uh, you, you mention any uh, structural or surface orientation. So... 
uh, I'm, I'm quite baffled uh, with that. Could you please comment on, on, well, being able to see these effects, what may be uh, interfaces and surfaces that do not have actually a crystal uh, orientation control? I see. Yeah, so uh, if I understand uh, your question correctly, is that, um, so for this case, like, uh, let me go back to, the slides over here, uh, maybe here. Okay, so um, so the orbital uh, over here, uh, of course, in this case, uh, for instance, in, in this year, uh, is a theoretical paper, I believe that they talk about the orbital texture. So all, almost in all, all, you know, both these, uh, you know, papers, they have this perfect crystal. And, you know, that's the reason how, that's the reason why they can, um, uh, believe that they can do this uh, first principle calculations. But over here in our case, we believe that uh, through our materials inspection, those are uh, polycrystalline. So within the grains, you know, they have this kind of crystal structures. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but the, then but you the, see an average effect over multiple yeah. orientations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but, but in, in the end, you know, uh, this does not rely on having a single crystal because um, uh, I believe that the, uh, the phenomenology of this uh, is similar to the spin hole effect that uh, because to, when you do the calculation, you always need to as assume that there's a perfect crystal, but in reality, you always have this uh, polycrystalline materials. Uh, but uh, macroscopically, you still have this kind of uh, uh, spin accumulation or orbital angular momentum accumulation that is related to how, like the direction of the current that you apply, uh, and um, and it depends on like how how you know the, the electrons are deflected. So that's just a I think a pictorial way to explain this. And if you look into all the uh, like like myself as an experimental student, when I look into all those experimental papers, they don't really, uh, you know, um, you know, discuss too much about like how this orbital texture or the crystal part actually comes into play. So uh, maybe that, maybe uh, somebody should because that seems yes. relevant. If if it's an yeah. orbital Hall effect, it should depend on which orbitals you're actually driving with your current direction, yeah. and evidently you have an effect so something is left over but actually i find this quite surprising because as you that means within your sample you're rotating the current vector with respect to the local crystal lattice and still something is left right so maybe yeah. if you have a single crystal orientation in particular in certain directions you have far larger effects yet mm -hmm. That's true, and and you know uh, I I think uh, for most of the discussions that I uh, you know that I uh, went through um, most of the time uh, there's an ambiguity you know between this uh, whether this orbital is coming from the moving electron or it is from the localized orbitals so uh, they don't really specify uh, you know what kind of orbital is actually giving giving this uh, you know this orbital current you know, or the phenomenology of orbital current. Um, as well, what I can see over here is that uh, at least using this pic picture, like most people use, it, it's it looks like the electrons are carrying this uh, you know angular momentum and they are moving around. Uh, right, but, but that will depend on the crystallographic direction, and so you may even have a sign change. So you see one. On the same material in one direction, one effect, and in another mm -hmm. direction, an opposite effect. Obviously, there's something net left because, well, you have a lot of data that that show that there is an effect there. It just right. uh, maybe to get to the heart of it and yet improve the efficiency. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe one somebody ought to look into that with uh, single crystal samples and and That's really right. do angular dependent measurements. I think one could learn a lot from that. That's right. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much. Yeah, so, yes. so there is a question by Professor Muduli. You may unmute and ask the question. Uh, hello. Yeah, I had uh, that question was already answered by Professor Pai. Uh, so he, he uh, I was just wondering about that drop in the efficiency with the chromium concentration, mm -hmm. and he has already explained. Uh, I see. 
<laughs> so yeah i was wondering whether it, this can be just due to the change of mechanism of uh, spin on effect from intrinsic or something but he already explained that uh, okay. okay all right thank you uh, so now i don't see any more questions so may i request you to stop sharing so then i will share my screen and present a small token of appreciation from us mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Uh, please stop sharing. Uh, let me. Yeah. Let me. Okay. Okay. So uh, I just like to bring to the attention of the uh, people that next week we are going to organ. Yeah. So next week, uh, over next week actually, from eight to tenth March. So we will be organizing this uh, conference uh, on uh, uh, Indo-Japan WhatsApp on interface phenomena for spintronics. So there are a lot of speakers from India and Japan they are meeting, but it is open for anybody. It's uh, registration is free. If you feel like, so you may kindly uh, see a lot of speakers from Japan and a lot of speakers from India and uh, registration free for students, uh, posters uh, welcome. So after deadline is Monday, but we'll extend it by two, three days. I will announce it on the website. And next week we will have the talk by Dr. Hariam Jani from NUS, Singapore. And uh, finally, last but not least, I'd like to present this uh, memento to Professor Singh Feng Pai for his excellent talk. So on behalf of everyone, I thank you and really very nice talk. So I read it for you, this digital memento. W2S seminar webinar series on spin tonics, National Institute of Science, Education and Research, NYSA, Bhubaneswar, India. Takes pleasure in presenting this plaque to Professor Si Feng Pai from National Taiwan University, Taiwan, in recognition and appreciation for being a valuable speaker to give a lecture on enhancing spin orbit torque efficiency via orbital currents. So thank you so much again, Sing Feng. Really, really kind of you and a uh, very nice interaction so if there are more i'm sure people will like to or i will be in touch with you i hope to see you in the subsequent uh, next talks uh, please encourage your group members it's free anybody can join at any moment of time i thank hope you. to see you around so thank you so much for taking the trouble talking so late in the night i wish you a good night and uh, see you sometimes thank you take care take care all see you next week same time thank you very much. Uh, thanks everyone for attending bye bye yeah. Good night, bye. bye.